This is actually from our old Algebra 2 book. We're going to do a couple of units out of our old Algebra 2 book before we get into the Algebra 2 book that we currently use. So this is real numbers and number operations. First, we're going to talk about some subsets of real numbers. For example, whole numbers. The whole numbers are the numbers 0, 1, 2, etc. What types of numbers did I not write down? No decimals and no negatives. Whole numbers are precisely that. They are whole. There's no decimals, no fractions, no negatives. Integers, dot, 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 negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. So notice this time there are negatives, but there are still no decimals. Rational numbers. What do you guess rational numbers are going to involve? Probably decimals. The first part of the term rational is the five letter word ratio. Ratio is another word for fraction. So rational numbers are numbers that can be written as a fraction. So this includes decimals that terminate. Terminate means the decimal ends. Like 0.25 is a decimal that terminates. You can rewrite 0.25 as the fraction 1 fourth. So 0.25 is a rational number. Repeated decimals are also included. 0.3 repeated, do you guys know what fraction 0.3 repeated is? One third. So if you can change the number into a fraction, it is a rational number. There are features on your calculator that allow you to change decimals to fractions and back again. I want you to get familiar with those. I would tell you exactly how to do it, but every calculator is just a little bit different. So if you don't know how to convert decimals to fractions on your calculator, please during work time bring your calculator to me and say, hey, show me that fraction thing and I will love to teach you how to change things to fractions. Once we've covered whole integers and rationals, um, I want you to think about the number 2. Could I write 2 as a fraction? I could write 2 over 1, or I, I could write 4 over 2, because 4 divided by 2 is 2. So 2 is also a rational number. Do you notice that 2 is a rational number? It's also an integer. It's also a whole number. Every single whole number is also an integer. Every single integer is also a rational number. So there's a little chart in your notes that I'd like you to fill out. Whole numbers go on the very inside. And I'm even going to write some helpful stuff in there. No negatives, no decimals. Every single whole number is also an integer. Thank you, computer, for being, you know, so lovely. Integers are positive and negative numbers, still no decimals. Every single whole number and every single integer is also a rational number. I think my screen just doesn't want me to zoom in because it keeps popping back to 100%, so maybe I just won't zoom. In your assignment, it's going to ask you to classify a number and use everything that applies. 
So if a number is whole, it's on the very, very inside of this rational number thing. A whole number is an integer, it's also a rational. So if it asks you to classify the number two, you would write whole integer rational. If it asks you to classify the number negative two, negative two is an integer, what else is it? Rational. So if it's a whole, it's all three. If it's an integer, it's both integer and rational. Anyone want to take a guess what this other box is for? Irrational numbers. And how about a guess what an irrational number is? If rationals are fractions, yep, decimals that can't be written as a fraction. One of the most famous irrational numbers is pi. Pi is a symbol that represents the number 3.14159 and it keeps on going and going and going and going. The decimal does not terminate, it does not repeat, it keeps going and going and going. There's no way to change that into a fraction, so it's an irrational number. Another irrational number is the square root of 2. The square root of 2 is a big, long, crazy decimal that doesn't repeat, doesn't end, doesn't have any sort of a pattern to it. Square root of 3 is another irrational number. You can also have negative irrational numbers. Quick question, is the square root of 4 irrational? What is the square root of 4? 2. And 2 is a whole number and an integer and rational. So hopefully this chart will help you when it says to classify. And um, hint, on the test, it will give you a list of numbers and then it'll write out like whole, integer, rational, irrational. And it'll say circle all that apply. So if the number is 2, you would circle whole and integer and rational. If you circle whole, you circle all three of those. If you circle integer, you circle both integer and rational. If it's irrational, you just circle irrational. If it's just a fraction, you just circle rational. So that's how it's going to look on your test. All right. Compare the numbers by placing a less than, greater than, or equal symbol between them. You may need to convert them into decimals before you can accurately compare them. So negative four-thirds, that is the decimal negative 1.3 repeated. Which is bigger, negative 1.3 repeated or negative 1? Negative 1. If you need to, think about the number line. Where would they fall on the number line? Whichever one is farthest on the right is the bigger number. So take a moment and try two and three. And I'm just going to tell you right now, four and five really annoy me. We're going to skip four. But do number five. Convert the square root of two and two times the square root of three into decimals and then put those numbers in order from least to greatest. So I'll give you a few minutes to do numbers two, three, and five. So number two, seven-fourths, if you do seven divided by four, that number is larger than five divided by three is. Number three, the square root of three is about 1.7, and that is smaller than 2.5. Number five, you need to convert the first two things to decimals. Here's why I dislike these problems, because when you write the numbers in order from smallest to largest, you're supposed to use the number as it was given to you, not the decimal that you converted it to. So it's just annoying to me because whenever these are on worksheets, there's never enough space to, it, it just, I think I'm too OCD. These problems annoy me. And I'm going to try to be honest with you whenever possible. I adore math. I really, really love math. But sometimes there's parts of math that just annoy me, and that's, that's totally fine. So make sure you think about your negatives. The only negative number is negative 3.2, so that is the smallest. Next smallest of the positives would be 0 0.01. 
then 0 0.1, and then 1.41, which is the square root of 2, and then 3.46, which is 2 times the square root of 3. At the bottom of this first page, there are some properties. I am not going to require that you memorize these properties. These properties are most often used in math when you are doing proofs. How many of you just got like a massive knot in your stomach because I said the P word? We are not doing proofs in Algebra 2. I would love it if we did because proofs are awesome, but I promise you we are not going to do proofs. So having the names of the properties memorized is really only helpful if you're going to be using the names of the properties as reasons in a proof. So I don't require that you memorize these. In your assignment, it actually says which property is being expressed, use your notes. So go back to your notes to look for these properties. The closure property is basically a property that just says if you start with real numbers and you add or you multiply, you are going to get real numbers. It's a property that they need to have in solving proofs just to show that if we're operating with real numbers, we are still going to have real number solutions. The commutative property says that we can change the order of addition or the order of multiplication and still have the same thing. The associative property deals with grouping. It says that you can add A and B together or B and C together first. It doesn't matter which order. It's very similar to the commutative property because it's talking about the order in which you're adding or the order in which you're multiplying, but it really has to do with the grouping of those things. Identity. The additive identity is zero. The multiplicative identity is one. So if you add zero to something, you don't change its value. If you multiply one to something, you don't change its value. You're multiplying or adding by the identity. The inverse also has to do with the identity. The inverse is what do you have to do to make a number turn into the identity? So if you take a number like two, you would add negative two and that would get you to the identity of zero. If you have a number like three, you'd multiply by the inverse one third and that would take you to the identity one. And there's the distributive property at the bottom. So on your assignment, it's going to say which property is being used, look at your notes, match up the properties, done. Next page. I would like you to try numbers eight through 13 on your own. It's just asking you to remember what the words difference, sum, product, quotient mean, and then a couple other quick problems. So try 8 through 13, and we'll go over them in a few minutes. All right, number 8. What is the difference of 3 and 5? Are some of you hesitating to answer because you think it might be a trick question? It kind of, it, it kind of is a trick question, honestly. I don't like it written like this. I would accept the answer 2 or negative 2. The difference means subtraction, so 3 minus 5 or 5 minus 3, so your answer is 2 or negative, well, negative 2 or positive 2. Really, when we're talking about difference, we're talking about what's the difference, like, on the number line. How many units are between 3 and 5? And the difference between 3 and 5 is 2 units. They are 2 units apart on the number line. So I think 2 is the most correct answer, but if you read it literally, the difference of 3 and 5, 3 minus 5 is negative 2. So I would accept either. The sum of 2 and 7, that's a little bit easier. 2 plus 7 is 9. Quotient means division. The quotient of 10 and 5, you would do 10 divided by 5, 2. The product of 3 and 5, product means multiply. 3 times 5 is 15. Number 12, a cabinet has four drawers. Each drawer is 12 inches tall. Four drawers, 12 inches per drawer. If you can say per, it's probably multiply. So 4 times 12, that is 48 inches. 